Thanks for the introduction and good morning, everyone. Um, okay, so um, in relation to legislation impacting water supplies, so firstly, I just want to mention, just checking the screens, okay, in relation to the drinking water directive. And I know this was spoke um, in relation to our conference last year as well. So just an update on that. So the proposed um, drinking water directive was adopted back in 2020 as the recast drinking water directive. And then it entered into force in January 2021. And member states, including Ireland, were given two years then to transpose it into national legislation. And this happened earlier this year. So I'm going to go through some of the changes in, in relation to the new recast drinking water directive. Just to mention as well, there is some lead-in periods and some elements of the directive that I'll talk about as well. Um, the final point then is in relation to expert groups and subgroups that were set up. So the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage established an expert group during the transition and implementation phase of the directive. Um, it's so going to talk about some of that as well. And there also was a number of subgroups that was established and many of those are continuing into the implementation phase. For example, there was one on source protection that I'm going to talk about as well. So just in relation to what's new in the directive, and I'm, I'm not looking at all elements, I'm only covering some of the points today. So the new recast drinking water directive includes updated safety standards. It includes a methodology on identifying and managing risk in relation to whole uh, water supply chains. It establishes a list uh, of emergency, emergency substances, introduces conformity provisions uh, for products uh, to be used in contact with drinking water. And in addition, it also includes new provisions that require member states to improve and maintain uh, access to drinking water for all. So there are some of the different articles of the directive that I'm going to go through um, this morning. So firstly, in relation to Article 7 in the directive, which is in relation to risk-based approach to water safety. So this is one of the new elements um, in the directive. And this is around requiring risk assessments and risk managements to be carried out on water supplies from catchment to consumer. And the regulation requires that these assessments reflect the water safety plan approach that's set out by the World Health Organization. And at the top of the slide there, there is a manual there, a water safety plan manual that was produced by the WHO. So uh, the assessments need to, to very much reflect, reflect that. Um, so the document then just on the bottom of the slide, which many of the schemes would be familiar with as well, is the National Federation's HACCP quality assurance system. And this has been implemented across regulated schemes for many years now. And it is envis envisaged that this uh, scheme Will be, will be adequate in terms of meeting the regulations, particularly for the smaller schemes, but for the, more, for the larger schemes where there's more complex risks, a more detailed assessment will be required. In addition, uh, the EPA developed um, an advice note around drinking water safety plans that was produced a number of years ago, and I understand that that's going to be updated as well. So in terms of the risk assessment and risk managements uh, that need to be carried out, any measures that are going to be identified in these assessments, where there is risks, measures need to be put in place in relation, in relation to those risks. So just to go into the next um, articles that I just want to talk about and staying with the risk assessment, risk management area, it's split into two in the directive. So Article 8 is in relation to risk assessment of your catchments, and then Article 9 is in relation to the rest of the supply chain. So from the abstraction, the treatment, storage, and the distribution network is covered under Article 9. So just um, staying with the source then, and everybody, uh, most people are really familiar with the Water Framework Directive, I know it was mentioned already this morning, um, and it very much has a link with the recast drinking water directive. You can see from this graphic that's on the screen that there is a crossover in terms of identification and implementation of source protection works. And it's very much linked with the Water Framework Directive in terms of uh, river basin management plans, uh, which, which is part of that directive. So it is important that the drinking water legislation fits in with existing requirements of the Water Framework Directive, which is about restoring and protecting our waterways and that they don't contradict each other. So in terms of risk assessment and risk management, one of the outputs from the subgroup I mentioned earlier, there was a subgroup on source protection, and one of the outputs from that subgroup was in terms of developing a national framework to have a standardised approach to integrating the, the Drinking Water Directive and the Water Framework Directive. And the guidance will address the drinking water source protection within the sources um, through source assessment and source management. And this uh, framework is due to be uh, finalised shortly. 
Just in relation to, um, to the sector then, a huge amount of work has been done in the group water scheme sector in the area of source protection, right back to the, the national pilot project that took place in 2005 on the Church of Lorham group water scheme in County Monaghan. There's been a huge amount of work done in, in almost that 20 year period. Uh, more recently, we had um, the pilot project phase two that started in 2018, and out of that, there was an output of the framework on source protection for drinking water sources. So in order to carry out proper risk assessment on catchment sources, this is the level that you need to be going to ideally, and it's linking into to integrated, to fully integrated source protection. Uh, reports and this framework it, came, it was out of that that study in 2018 and then it was piloted on 14 schemes over the last two years on integrated source protection plans and this was under measure one source protection under the multi-annual rural water program and it's very welcome to see that there now is a dedicated measure under the capital program for source protection works and there's been a lot of learning in that process in the pilot for us as an organisation and we, we do plan to amend our framework that it will marry in with the national framework uh, that's been produced by the subgroup um, in order to meet the, the regulations. Um, and the plan then is to continue with the, the integrated source protection work, uh, focusing on the schemes in the river basin cycle, cycle two and also the draft cycle three schemes, um, focusing on the identified areas for action, subject to funding uh, and submissions made under the multi-annual programme. But it's important to say as well where schemes can afford to complete any source protection work or any ISPPs themselves, um, it would be good uh, to, to try and press on with that work where the schemes have the resources. So just in terms of timelines then for the risk assessments under the, the drinking water regulations. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, they're split into two. So Article 8 in terms of the catchment, these risk assessments must be completed by the water suppliers by July 2027. And in terms of the supply system uh, risk assessments, they need to be completed by 2029. And the regulations require that they need to be reviewed at least every six years, but it is very much an ongoing process where you're identifying risks, you're putting measures in place, it's, it's a constantly review, it's not just a report that's going to be done that sits on a shelf, it's a live ongoing document. Um, the requirement for these assessments apply to water, su water suppliers uh, under the regulations that are serving greater than 10 cubic metres a day. Um, and as mentioned earlier, where there is um, corrective action uh, outlined in the assessments, uh, risk management uh, in terms of reducing those risks, measures need to be put in place. Just to mention, uh, and those that attended our conference last year, you will remember my colleague Adrian Smith spoke in relation to a tool that the National Federation was developing around water safety planning to assist schemes in carry out, carrying out risk assessments on their water supplies. It's currently being trialled across a number of schemes and we hope to have this available later this year. The tool uh, will be very user friendly for the, for the schemes and training will be provided to enable schemes, particularly where there's mar man managers in place to carry out risk assess assessments themselves. Um, the tool will cover from catchment to consumer and it uses a risk matrix looking at likelihood and impacts of risks occurring to enable you to prioritise what risks need to be dealt with um, most importantly. And it is important to note that, that the plan is the water supplier's own plan. It's not uh, kind of one size fits all. It's very, it is very much a circular process in terms of constantly reviewing uh, the risks. So the plan will be bespoke to every scheme uh, while sharing a common structure. So, and it will be important when we, we do the trials across the schemes to ensure that the plan does reflect the approaches of the World Health Organization guidelines and the requirements that re that's required under the legislation. Um, in terms of monitoring then under the, the regulations, um, there is um, there is a transitional provision for some new parameters, um, those that are familiar with, there is a number of new parameters um, in the drinking water regulations from the directive and they are coming in in 2026. There is some of the parameters where limits will be reducing, uh, not for a number of years, but there is some, for example, chromium and lead. Uh, the area of compliance monitoring, auditing, issuing of directions, all of that uh, continues as has been uh, in place in the previous drinking water regulations. Exempted supplies, uh, and O'Brien mentioned that in his talk in relation to exempted supplies, so they may not come under the regulations, but there is still a responsibility there for the very small schemes in terms of protecting human health and where there is any risks identified that the, the consumers need to be ma made aware of that. So it's still very much protection of human health for those 
um, exempted supplies. I'm not going to go through the details of the parameters. Um, they're in the new regulations, and those that are highlighted in red are some of the new parameters that is coming in over the next couple of years. Just in relation to Article 11 and 12 in the new directive, this in, is in relation to material and substances that come in contact with drinking water through the source uh, to tap chain, and they're going to be subject to minimum hygiene and other requirements to ensure that they don't have any effect in relation to water quality. And this will include your pumps, your pipe work, treatment chemicals, filter media, etc. all of those elements. This area is still, still evolving at the moment, but there is an active EU working group on material and substances that's going to be providing... Um, scientific and technical support to subgroups around the areas of material and substances. So there will be a national approach in terms of implement implementation um, of the directive in this area. So just to move on then in relation to um, Article 16, access uh, to water um, intended for human consumption. So this uh, article in the directive is where member states shall take the necessary measures to improve or maintain access to water intended for human consumption. So over the last year or so, we've had a, a refill station initiative that has been happening, and thanks to funding provided through a number of projects uh, with both the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, the Water Advisory Unit. Uh, we also had funding through the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine in addition, we also had a number of schemes around the country who installed water uh, refill stations uh, from their own resources as well. And the installation of these stations are very much supporting this element of the directive. They're, they're improving and maintaining access, uh, access to water for all, as well as encouraging the provision of water in public. They're raising awareness around this area. They're promoting the use of tap water, as well as helping to reduce uh, single-use plastics as well. Uh, and based on the number of stations that has been installed um, in previous projects and, and current projects that's ongoing, it's estimated that we'll have around 30 uh, water stations installed in group scheme communities around the country by the end of the year. So well done to all involved in that. Um, there is a plan as well in terms of mapping the locations of these re refill stations and hopefully linking them to an app as well. Um, in relation to Article 17, then, uh, just in relation to information to the public. So this is in relation to member states shall ensure that persons that are supplied with, with water intended for human consumption receive the following information at least once a year. That's, what state, that's what's stated in the directive. And this is around the area of water quality, water price, volume of water. It does mention websites in the directive and the legislation as well, or by other information. So it could be an annual bill that you're sending to schemes, newsletters, etc. Um, but just to ensure that this information is getting out to your members. We have a number of schemes around the country now that are setting up websites to provide, provide a lot of information for their members where they can go in and pay bills, etc. So that um, is really is, is ticking the box for a lot in terms of that article. Just in relation to the Water Framework Directive um, 2000, um, and this uh, in terms of protecting and improving water quality for all water, so it's covering your rivers, your lakes, etc. cetera, uh, and I know the river basin management plans and the next cycle was, was mentioned earlier. But I wanted to particularly focus on two more recent uh, regulations and acts, particularly around the area of abstractions that's linked to the Water Framework Directive. So there was new regulations that came in in 2018, and that was the European uh, Union Water Policy Abstractions Registration uh, Regulations, and this gave effect to the 2000 uh, Water Framework Directive as ex the existing legislation wasn't fully compliant in the area of abstractions. And this legislation was brought in as an interim measure to enable a register to be set up Thanks, Joe. To enable, to enable a register to be set up, um, and this is managed by the EPA. So we would have helped the development officers on the gro ground, would have helped the schemes across the country in, in recent years when this came in, in in 2018 in terms of registering their abstractions. So it applied to any, any uh, body that was abstracting greater than 25 cubes of water. So you had to register whether you had one source or multiple sources, you had to register them all. So that register has been maintained by the EPA. And uh, also on the EPA website, that register is now published there in August. Um, it's available for download um, while taking effect of... Um, um, sorry, I'm missing a bit. Lost my train of thought there. Um, so, yeah, it's published by the EPA uh, online on their website. 
So just further then in relation to the abstractions in 2022, the Water Environment Abstractions and Associated Poundments Act came in, and this gives further effect to the 2000 Directive uh, to provide for the regulations of water abstractions and their associated impoundments. In this whole area, the likes of uh, environmental impact assessments may be required. Abstraction licenses will be required uh, for water suppliers abstracting more than 2,000 cubes a day. But also, the licensing may apply to those that are abstracting less where significant environmental risks has been determined. So regulations are expected uh, from this Act and I'll give further details on how the particulars of the Act will come into force. So we're just kind of waiting for the regulations and guidance on this area. So just in conclusion, that was a very uh, quick snapshot in terms of particularly the, the Recast Drinking Water Directive and, the, and their regulations. There is more details to come out in relation to guidance documents and frameworks, frameworks and the expert groups that I mentioned, the subgroups, a number of which are still continuing into the implementation uh, phase, So, um, as well as for the details around the abstractions as well. So there is a lot of learning for everyone involved, as I said, I've just given a flavour. But just in conclusion for the group schemes here today, there is a number of areas that I'd like to see you focusing on. So it's important that the group scheme boards and the staff familiarise themselves with the regulations and the requirements. Um, attending training courses, we're about to launch our autumn a training programme for a number of training courses and workshops that are going to be run. It's very important that all schemes attend these courses and that they're well represented and that the information is brought back to your boards and your staff. Uh, in terms of investing in resources, you can see the level of assessment in risk and risk management that is going to need to be carried out under the regulations. Ensure that you've got the staffing in place to do that or is it going to be done by some, somebody voluntary on your board? Um, and it may be just a, a part-time staff that you need to put in place. Looking at tools to assist with regulations requirements as well. Reviewing your existing quality assurance system that you have in place. Undertaking or reviewing raw water monitoring program. Looking at operational monitoring that you're doing on your network. Is it, is it isn't enough in terms of meeting the regulations? Look at ways to improve effective means of communication with your consumers. You can see the, the requirements under the legislation in relation to information that you need to get out to your consumers. And also, consider long-term sustainability of your scheme. We've had very successful amalgamation and rationalizations of smaller schemes down through the years, and this can help schemes to meet these regulations and be more sustainable into the future as well. Look, there is a lot of information uh, available on our website. Uh, all the talks from today are going to be made available on our website over the coming weeks as well. And of course, our development officers are always at the end of the phone or on the ground to come out and meet your scheme uh, to go through any concerns or you know requirements under the new regulations. Shane, go to me, my